Wow. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of, well, it isn't another episode. It's a new episode. <laughs> I've got to change my it, lingo here. It's another new episode. That's right. Uh -huh. So we are now the Relative Run Readiness Podcast. Relative Run Readiness. Say that 10 times fast. Yeah. Or R3, right? R3. So, R3. So we were the Pandola Project podcast, and of course, I'm still Matt Pandola, so I guess we're still... You're not Matt Relative? Pandola Project lives. It still lives. It lives inside you. I want to live. But this is something that's been a passion of mine for a while to really brand this to running and to really focus on the running. The reason why, essentially, is because not only is it my passion, but... Doing this project over the last year and a half with the Pandola Project has been, well, very rewarding, really exciting to talk about all these different aspects of health and fitness. And we still are doing that. We still will do that. But just niching it down to running in particular to endurance, because that is, after all, it's my main passion. It's what I spend 99% of my day doing and thinking about. And at the at the end of the day, I want to be able to serve people the best that I possibly can with the best information. And there's so many topics that we can talk about, even just with running alone. Also, we've been getting almost all of our requests for running for runners, for triathletes, any kind of endurance type of sports, even involving things like, um, you know, hiking the PCT trail and things like mm -hmm, this. So, mm -hmm. so we, we have decided to really focus on that. And of course, when I write up programs, I have amazing athletes like Gabby Williams, who set the world junior record in the high jump when she was in high school. I was lucky enough to to be with her through a lot of that process and now all the way till today when she's a professional basketball player and I will still give everything I've got to help people like her get to that next level. But that being said, most of my athletes, uh, most of the athletes that I get to work with, they're not my athletes, you know, <laughs> I don't own them. Um, they, they are runners, they are triathletes, uh, they love endurance. And so this is where I think I can spend most of my time talking about these things and helping out people more. So this is now going to be our, our new product that we're putting out and we'll talk about with our OTT platform, how you can follow along. But first of all, Chad, what'd you do this, yes, this last weekend? Oh, I, I unlike you, um, I spend about four percent thinking about endurance and running and and that sort of thing. Uh, the rest of the time, uh, I think about my two and a half year old daughter uh, and my wife and uh, my nine year old son, ten year old son now, uh, twelve year old daughter and nineteen year old son. Uh, that's a lot of kids. Yes, and uh, yeah, we we spend some time together, uh, me and the family. And, uh, you know, coloring projects, that's high up on my list. We do a lot of that. Um, when, when I'm not coloring or watching Coco Melon, uh, I, uh, I just started watching my wife and our oldest daughter have already watched almost the whole thing, but I just started watching Cobra Kai. Oh yeah. Cobra Kai, man. I loved when I was a kid, it came out. I thought it was the carrot kid. I wasn't a great speller either. The carrot kid. I was like, it's the, the carrot kid. What's that about? <laughs> <laughs> and everybody was, uh, you know, talking about this movie I had to see. And I realized it was this relatively unknown to me sport called karate karate yes but i love the story because <laughs> i was great. that skinny awkward kid who got picked on and stuff and um for some reason i didn't learn karate but man you should have yeah where would you be now yeah I, I did learn boxing to an extent and as did you uh mm -hmm. i will i will be the first to admit you are a, a phenomenal boxer and i'm i'm what i would consider to be i'm i'm good i'm I'm not great. You, you were actually uh, so good that I remember our we had the same boxing coach, and and uh, he was saying how you should really actually compete. And then he would look at me and say, "Matt, you know, keep running." <laughs> <laughs> That's your best defense, too. Yeah, it's your best defense. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, so I've been watching that. You, you know, 
the one of the things that I love so much is um, the concept of concept of anti heroes because it comes out pretty early on. If, I'm not ruining anything when I say this, but it comes out pretty on uh, early on that that both Johnny, who is the um, the villain in the movie. Uh, the original movie, and um, Danny, who was the hero, uh, Daniel LaRusso, who was the hero, they're both anti-heroes now. They both have uh, uh, some really bad qualities to them and also some really redeeming qualities to them. And I think that that's what's so brilliant about how uh, layered and nuanced and real they've made this reboot. Um, And that's, I think, what keeps it interesting. What also keeps it interesting is that if you just say... It, more than one time in a row, if you say Johnny, if you say Johnny, Johnny, you're immediately transported to the mid 80s. <laughs> I mean, that is a line taken from every third 80s movie. Johnny, Johnny, do it for Johnny. <laughs> Remember that? Uh, what was that one? The, the... Do it for Johnny. Oh, that was um, uh, with all the big. Ralph Macchio, yeah. too. He was Johnny in that movie. Um, uh, the Outsiders. The Outsiders. That's yeah, yeah. They, great book. Too. That, yeah, I was going to say they wrote a decent book from the movie, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a great adaptation. <laughs> Going backwards like that. Yeah, do it for Johnny. <laughs> but but no, yeah. I and do you remember when my wife was testing for her black belt? You weren't there, but I, I I told you the story after my daughter Mia had her birthday party at the same place because mm-hmm. she was also um, in martial arts at the time, and um, I had uh, watched my wife in her uh, her event that she was doing to test for her black belt, and and uh, at a certain point. For a black belt test, they have several people attacking you at once, and you have to just defend and things like that. And I was screaming out, send her home in a body bag. <laughs> and everybody's just kind of look. I'm like, come on, come on. You guys oh got to know. You got to know it. So I, I also um, quoted that when, when Mia had her birthday party at the martial arts place, and they were just doing little fun little <laughs> combat stuff. And I was like, send her home in a body bag. <laughs> Hopefully, people know what I was talking about, not thinking I was one of those parents. But anyways, um, so just talking a little bit about projects, I was doing this new project with Mia where I decided I would get this crystal horse, which is cute because Mia thought, uh, my daughter Mia is nine, but she thought that maybe the crystals were like actual real crystals. Like, Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, Yeah. but they're not. Uh, But this was quite the project. We spent about five hours trying to, you're essentially taking these little pieces and you're putting them together like a puzzle, but it's a 3D puzzle. Mm -hmm. And I kept holding the pieces with my hands, trying to keep it all together because it is 3D and the horse is standing up on its hind legs. And then just at a certain point, I would just lose it and the whole thing would just go all over the table. Yeah. And we did that five times. And I finally decided that we are going to super glue the damn thing. And so we're going to be doing that uh, this weekend, <laughs> super gluing every piece. Make sure you wear like vinyl gloves or something. All right. So it doesn't right. get super yeah, glued. No, your that'll hands. be me. I'll get my fingers stuck together. Hey, I'm the guy that just, when we were just talking, we did our, our strength training. Yes, we practice what we preach and, and uh, we strain to, to train together in the mornings now. And then it got done. I made my protein shake. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, it's just out of convenience. By the way, I like I like the convenience of having my protein shake. I I don't have as much food here at the gym, so I, I made my shake. I drank it really quick to do other things, and I have been called an idiot savant for several reasons. But the main one is because I'm famous for this. Where now I. Uh, st- took a little bit of dish soap. I soaked the shake bottle in some dishwater soap and let letting it sit. And then I go back about uh, 20 minutes later and I see my shake sitting there. I'm like, oh, I forgot to drink my shake. So I just had a little bit of soap water. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and I don't know why that's relevant look, to look, the topic. My but. favorite, my favorite story uh, along these lines is when we had the original gym 15 years ago or whatever, um, it, you were out of a, a cooler, you were a plastic, big plastic cooler. Um, you were making a lost and found box for like people who left their hat or whatever at the gym. You just or coat and you just throw it in that box and people can look through it, whatever. Well, you started writing in big, uh, Sharpie marker on the top. You started writing lost and found. But then halfway through, somebody started talking to you, and you wrote Lost and Faust. <laughs> I 
<laughs> I remember that. <laughs> and we had that box forever. Forever. Lost yeah. and Fost. Lost and Fost. Yeah. It's no, I, I do remember that. that great was... conversation starter. Exactly. And just a constant reminder to me of who I am. Yep. 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 Um, Speaking yeah. of who you are. Yep. Um, this rebranding, mm-hmm. which you, uh, which we talked about in just the beginning, um, I mean, I, I I wouldn't necessarily call it a rebranding. I think you you uh, called it correctly when you said niching down, niching down. I, yeah, really and I've, I've always wanted to just niche down more. Uh, I think if you look at the evolution of the Pendola training in general, we started off general population, which, you know, by the way, I learned a lot from it and I loved it in its own way. But then eventually I started getting more athletes and those athletes happen to be successful in court sports. So I was kind of known for being a volleyball strength coach for a while. Mm-hmm. And it just happened to be the athletes that at the time came in and, and they became all Americans and they put me on the map and then their team went undefeated for two years. And it, that kind of stuff uh, sent me down different paths. And I learned so much, like working with Les Nesbitt, we keep talking about how much I learned about him and his heart conditions and his knee surgery and all of these different things that he had going on. And on top of, on top of it all, you know, he's now 80 years old. So looking at how that worked from 60 to 80, because we've been working together for 20 years. But what I ended up realizing it, all these things taught me a lot to be a better strength coach for endurance athletes and for myself. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I started to finally get more of those runners and even created a team was a coach for a long time and at different levels, but mainly high school. And then some master's guys started coming in and then some of the top uh, female athletes that I get to work with. And of course, Gwen Jorgensen is is probably my uh, best known or the best known athlete that I've had the pleasure to, to work with. But being, being part of this process and understanding that now I can take everything I learned. I mean, I, I have things that I did with less that I still use today on a world champion right? And it works. It's just that now most of my conversations, they revolve around rating, right? Around what the gate is like after getting off the bike or what Mm -hmm. the gate is like in the last mile of a 10 K, right? So that's where I decided we really just, I think, need to focus down on this. And in the business side of things, brick and mortar, that's essentially what I did for the last year. And now we're doing it with the podcasting and the online training. Right. So we're taking uh, now this podcast and we're trying to line it up with what we're offering through um, our uh, online training system. Um, which you can find uh, at uh, Pendola Project Relative Readiness dot vhx dot tv, um, and um, you know that training that we're putting up there right now, those videos we're making, the forms that we're making to follow along with, those are all helping people get ready to run better, to run healthier, um, to keep their bodies in good mechanical shape and form and make sure that they can get out, whether it's on the trails or on the track or whatever, and and get out there and really reach their running goals. That's right. And people ask about what we want out of doing this podcast in the first place. And although this is a... By people, do you mean me? Yeah, exactly. What what are you doing this for? Why are you doing this? (laughs) Exactly. And I guess we should also make sure people understand that Chad is not only um, a business uh, manager, but he is now actually a partner in the business. And also we have been friends ever since our AmeriCorps days, we've been brothers. Um, And when I say that, it was the Nassau Civilian Community Corps. We met over 25 years ago now, was it? God, I don't know. Yeah, it's over over 25 years ago. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And we work together. And, and again, you know, we've been uh, thick as thieves ever since. So it, it made sense that you would partner in with this adventure with me. And doing that, we were talking about why we want to get this out there. There's so much 
misinformation out there. And the influences are, uh, they're, they're tough to understand who is a good influencer and, and who is full of it, right? Um, and there's some people, by the way, that they're well-meaning coaches that maybe are giving some misinformation, but it's not that, it's just what they've been taught. And now they're teaching something that's um, maybe some misinformation as well. And I certainly have been there myself in the past. And then what I eventually did was, besides, of course, just reading um, books and just voraciously just getting as much good information as I could over the years. But it really boiled down to eventually I got the opportunities to work with world-class coaches like Bobby McGee and, of course, athletes like Gwen. And this is what has really helped to catapult me and my understanding of what is relative for runners. That just is not in books. I mean, yeah. it, you know, it, there's there's there are bits and pieces, but it's hard to understand how to put those things together and so I really want to get the word out. This is what we actually do at the very highest levels. And guess what? Even though you might not be running 100 miles a week, okay, to be a, uh, you know, a competitive world-class runner, th that doesn't mean that you follow different steps. You might be doing different mileage and you might be doing different workouts, you might be doing different speeds, all those kind of things, but the concepts are still going to be the same because we're all human. Right, right, right. Well, I, you know, I think one of the funny things is, is that, you know, people who um, make these uh, goals, they say, I'm going to run a 5K. And so they just go out and start running. And they think that's the best way to get to running their 5K. And, and that might work for some people. They might just be able to get out there and start putting one foot in front of the other and do it with, you know, relatively little pain maybe or no pain maybe. Um, but that's not to say that their their body is ready to actually take on that work. And what we're trying to do, especially in this first assessment series on uh, uh, our online training, is teach people to say, okay, take a look at your body. Take a look at the way that it's moving together all integrated together and take a look at these different parts to uh, separately. And let's make sure that they're moving um, together uh, in healthy ways, um, that they are getting the range of motion that they need to get uh, in uh, able to move in. And then once you're able to have symmetry in your body and be able to pull all those things together, all the different parts of the body to be able to move uh, efficiently and effectively, and um, hopefully then also without pain, if you do have pain, um, you know, that's what this assessment is for. It's not, hey, running it, running is fantastic, and it can be fantastic for the vast majority of people, but your body's got to move right. Right. You know, yesterday, my daughter has horseback riding lessons. Mm -hmm. So she, I, I was there watching her and just listening, and she's got a wonderful trainer, and this woman's been doing this all her life, especially working with kids. So she's really good at it, but she was giving me uh, some cues, and one of the things she was saying is, uh, I want you to get your feet under your hips while she's riding, and she was saying, you know, see how she's leaning back right now. That's the opposite of what she wants to do, right? And it's it was really interesting because everything she was saying it really tied into the same things i coach about in running and she said you know it's just so important at these younger ages that they learn these mechanics because of what we kind of refer to as pattern matching right where essentially you know you learn how to ride a bike it's like learning how to ride a bike they say right you, you haven't ridden a bike for 20 years and then you get on the bike and really within a few minutes, probably you're, you're, you might not be as fit as you were 20 years ago, but you're certainly, you can ride the bike, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's how amazing the nervous system is and remembers and remembers. And, but we have to also be aware that it remembers what we teach it. Right. So in these beginning phases where Mia, uh, she's, well, she's now been horseback riding for a few years, 
but with COVID, we had to take last year off, really. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, really interesting to see, though, this pattern matching that Mia had left off with a year ago. And now it's all picked right back up already within a couple sessions. Yeah. So that's my point to running because, yeah, anybody can ride a bike. Anybody can ride a horse. Okay. Anybody can run. But there are those that do it with a little bit more neuromuscular facilitation. In other words, it's a little bit um, more congruent with their mechanics. It allows them to distribute, distribute power a little bit more efficiently. So that's why there are some of us that look like we are gliding when we run. And there are others that look like they are bouncing and pounding, and <laughs> right? And I would yeah. say, of course, I say some of us do it very, you know, the, the very few that we really glide along, and then most of us don't. And it is something that we have to not only learn, but probably relearn, which is a bit harder. So in other words, if we had learned these mechanics when we we're Mia's age, then sure, it would come a lot more natural to us. We would run with our stack. We would mm -hmm. run by, you know, uh, leaning and hinging through the ankles, but not the hips. Those kind of things have to be retaught to us because we didn't have that. And uh, I'd finish with, I had a guy who was, uh, he was a, a phenomenal runner. He actually won the Stanford Invitational uh, when he ran in high school with me. And he said uh, he was very much into the Kenyan philosophies and um, More Fire, a book that, that I've read several times about Kenyan running. And so how come they don't have to do this type of training? How come they don't have to worry about these things? And they're the best in the world. And I said, well, if you want to live their lifestyle and you want that, um, then, you know, Bob Larson is another American coach that's, uh, he coached Meb Kapletsky and Bob is well known for his different philosophies about running that actually work, but his background, he was, uh, he, he grew up on a farm and he had to just constantly work to exhaustion and he built, um, a very strong work ethic, but also a very strong foundation li literally right mm -hmm. so so mm -hmm. he had a lot of that already and it was nothing for him to run from one end of his property to the other or just having to run into town or to get to school every day so sounds familiar right with yep. the kenyan way of living that that we read about so you know there's a lot of things that do kind of disrupt our processes and we have to realize like you know from the couch to the marathon, right? And there's all these programs out there where they take you from the couch to your first 5K and then 10K in mm -hmm, the marathon. Mm -hmm. But really, I feel like that process is really rushed. I, I'm hoping that people will get the point that we should be getting off the couch, of course, yes. And we should be starting with the ba basics and leaving the egos behind and really not worrying about the 5K right away. And then eventually when we do get to the point where we're doing 5Ks and 10Ks, and we're even going after, say, podium finishes, maybe age group categories, things like that. Um, you know how many times that I'm, I'm talking... I won't name drop here back and forth, but I'm lucky enough now where I have some world champions and I'm talking to this one guy who's world champion. And uh, he, I say to him, okay, we're going to start off with these three basic movements. And within, I'd say it was probably six days of him doing these movements. He started noticing some pretty big differences uh, on the track. Uh -huh. Okay. And in the water, because he's a triathlete. And just, this is my point to it is the, the very best in the world go back to the basics. And we started off talking about, you know, the karate kid and Cobra Kai, right? Yep, yep, yep. Miyagi, the Miyagi method is what I call it, right? I And that's just the basics. It's you're doing the basics better than anyone else, right? Right, or better than you, more importantly, probably have ever done them. So sand the floor, paint the fence, right, right, and you can and you can uh, be the very best version of you. So that kind of sums up, I think, this this product that we've been working on. And I don't even like to call it a product. I mean, it's a passion, and it's something that 
we have seen now thousands of athletes over the last 20 years that I've been blessed to work with that have benefited from this. And, you know, it didn't start off perfect and it certainly can always improve, but I feel like I've poured 20 years into this platform now that I feel will really change some things for a lot of people and allow them to not only run that marathon eventually, if that's the goal, but more importantly, to be able to run in 10 years and 15 yeah. and 20 years yeah. from now. Well, uh, you bring up a good point too. And, and as long as you've been doing this, uh, and, and, you know, taking some, um, you know, lefts here at Albuquerque and rights and all of these things and expanding your business and then shrinking your business down and now refocusing on, uh, running in particular, um, you know, part of why we're doing this podcast now, um, it, that we've determined is to reinvigorate these topics and reinvestigate these topics and go back to say some of those topics that you ran into maybe as a, a, a high school runner or training for the Olympics or whatever, or topics 20 years ago when you first started the gym or topics, you know, two weeks ago when you were working with world-class athletes. I think it's important for, uh, for you certainly, and for us and, and hopefully for our listeners to really look at some of these topics and reinvestigate them and reinvigorate them and, and say, okay, well, maybe we did it this way 20 years ago, but now this is what I've learned. And this hopefully is a, a more effective way to get, you know, better running mechanics or to get you, you know, a minute off your 10 K or whatever it is. But, um, you know, I think these topics are really important to reinvestigate as well as some new topics. Um, and, and to that end, I would also encourage our listeners to, uh, email us if they've got questions, um, specifically about training, maybe, uh, but also about running, um, you know, anything like that, go ahead and send us an email and you can, uh, it, it will be in where the podcast is, but it's pendola training at gmail.com P E N D O L A training.com. Uh, at gmail.com um, and uh, give us some topics that you want to hear us talk about specifically as it has to do with training for running or running itself. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think our Instagram that we've been working a little bit more on one minute videos also is a good resource to go mm -hmm. to there just to see little snips, little tidbits about what you can do. So we're uh, when I say what you can do, these are just uh, oftentimes movements that you might be able to do before you run or while you're running a little bit of a snip on how to run downhill more efficiently, for exa example. So again, I learned a great cue from Bobby McGee about stepping down when you run downhill. So I decided to put that into just a quick little video when I was running down a canyon the other day. So these type of things are going to be in the Instagram and we will definitely look forward to those emails. We will answer questions from the emails. Let us know what you want to talk about and what is relative to your running so you will be ready. Right. Yeah, man. That's what's relative. That's what's relative. All right, guys. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.